In this video, we are going to talk about one of the pillars of object-oriented programming, which is called inheritance. And we're going to learn about inheritance through building a little RPG battle system over a couple of videos. And um, this concept requires a little bit of introduction to fully understand. So we're going to start building something. We'll get to the point where we need inheritance, and then we'll introduce inheritance. And one note that I want to throw up at the beginning of this is that even though we're using games as an example in this video, this applies to software development in general. So if you're building a music playing application or you're building a e-commerce site, um, this concept still applies in those situations. Okay, so pretend that we work at this RPG studio um, and we are the developers and the designers are going to come to us with requests for different features and we're going to have to build them out. So they come to us and tell us that we're going to make this game about the player who has accidentally shrunk themselves down to a tiny size so that they are going to end up encountering insects um, and other creatures that they have to survive and battle uh, with to make it back to their original size. Uh, and the designers tell us that the first thing the player is going to encounter in the game is a ant, which is normal size in the real world. But since we're small, this is a, a huge uh, challenge and dangerous situation. So I'm just going to draw a little simple ant here. And the designers tell us that the player's not going to encounter just one ant. There's going to be all sorts of ants that they're going to encounter in the first level of the game. And some will be small and power, uh, and not powerful, and some will be big and more powerful. So we're going to need some kind of variations built into our ant structure. So we have multiple ants here. And the designers also tell us that in their game concept, these ants are going to have a name. Each one has their own name. Um, they're each going to have their own health. Uh, they're going to have some kind of art associated with them. They'll have their own color that we'll use for displaying information about the ant. Um, and they'll have some kind of like charge distance that they can dash at the, the player uh, or distance over which they can dash at the player. And they'll need some way to like display their information to the screen. And they'll need some kind of um, charge functionality and some kind of bite functionality. So this is all the information that the designer gets us. We think about this like, oh, we, we've got all of these pieces of information. We've got these different pieces of functionality. And we're going to have multiple ants in our world. So we sit down and we think, well, a class is probably a good way to approach this. We could think about building an ant class that incorporates all of these features that the designers are telling us we need. And we can use that class as a template to stamp out a bunch of different ants in our world. It just so happens that I have listed these out basically in almost a UML structure. So I am going to draw a box here. Throw our name at the top for ant. And display info here, charge, bite, put parentheses at the end to indicate that these are uh, operations. So our ant has these attributes, name, health, text, art, color, charge, distance, and these operations, display info, charge, bite. To finish out this UML, we should define a type for all of these pieces of information. So we can say our name is a string. Let's say that the designers are telling us that integers are fine for health. Text art, since we're making an ASCII console game, we'll make that a string. The color, we'll make a console color. And uh, charge distance, we can make a double. Then for our methods here, we want to make sure that we return, we mark the return type. And for this structure, let's just say all of these don't return anything. They're, they're methods that have a return type of void. 
we can actually get a little bit more specific here with our UML at this point, and we can mark what things are private and what things are public. So one of the conventions that you can use in UML is that a plus sign before one of these members, whether it's an operation or an attribute, means that it's public, and a minus sign means that it's private. So we've got our ant mapped out. We've, we've met the designer's specifications in terms of the different piece of information we need to store, the different functionality, and we're all set up so that if we made this in our code, we could stamp out multiple ants here and put as many as we want in the game world for the player to encounter. So far, so good. No new concepts involved. We haven't really needed to talk about inheritance just yet. So before we uh, get to the next designer's request that's going to need us to bring in inheritance, let's make this code. So we'll make a version that has this ant with all of this information packed into it. And I'll have a starter console application uh, linked in the description that you can download and use. There's not a lot in here. Currently, all this does is pop open a console window with a title and press any key to continue for a little micro RPG. This project has a program class that sets up the title and then tells our uh, creates a new game and tells that game to run. So in the game class here, we have an empty constructor. We have a public run method, which is going to be the thing that's going to kick off our game logic. And we have a private wait for key press method that we can reuse later. We also have an art assets static class. So this is just a static class that has a public field for my B art, which we'll use in a little bit, and some ASCII art here for my ant. And I also have put together a little character art file. Um, this is also stored in a gist that I will have linked, but I, I just pulled together a couple of creatures that if we decide to take this further, um, we can add these different creatures to our world. And all of these are cited here, where they came from, the artist that made them, the link to where to find it. So what I would encourage you to do is think about that UML that we just created here and see if you can make that ant class. So just pause the video here, try translating that into an ant class, and then come back and we will code along and build it out. So I'm going to pretend that you paused and I'm going to charge forward. So we want to create a new class here. I'm going to right click on my um, project and add class. I am going to call this ant. And of course, you can also add to your project from up here. Add class. That also works. So in translating this, All of these become fields, and I have denoted that I want to mark them all as private. It's a good place to start with all of your fields and methods being private, and then only making the ones that need to be more accessible um, public as you need them to be public. So let's make this name here. Uh, let's see, we need a health text art, so int health private string text art. Uh, we also need a color and a charge distance, private console color, color, private int charge distance. And we didn't put this in the UML, but it is good to have a constructor here. So I'm going to create a public ant constructor and I'm going to want to take in a name health text art color charge distance and initialize them so the ants name the ants health um let's let's actually skip the text art for a second we'll we'll talk about that in a second um console color 
color and let's put in the charge distance. And I'm just going to take these parameters that we created and drop them into our fields. And whoops, this should be lowercase c, so that this is a distinct variable from this field up here. So for text art, we could have the ant have a parameter for the art that gets passed in. Um, but since I only have in my art assets here one ant, I'm just going to, to start off, make all ants have the same art. So my text art is going to be equal to art assets dot ant. So that static class allows me to access those public fields that are created here, the public field of ant. So I can just reference that straight from my ant class. At this point, it would be good to pause and try running it. So we can try creating an ant that has those values filled in, and then we can come back and fill out our operations and make sure those work. So if I go back to my game, I'm going to want to create a private ant and um, you know, we'll make a goofy uh, punny name of fire ante, which will be our first ant. And then I will instantiate that ant here. And um, let's you let's say fire ante has a health of 100 and a let's do of course a red color here and a charge distance let's say that the charge distance is like inches so let's say fire ante can charge three inches so we created a field for fire ante here and then we uh, instantiated an ant and put it into that field so this starts off as null because we don't put anything into this field and then we we set it up here So right now our fire ante here has been created and all of these fields should hopefully be filled in, but all of these are private. So if we wanna test that this is working, we could print something out here, like make sure we print out the name, health, color, charges, and text art to see that they're filled in. Or the easier thing to do would be to just throw a breakpoint into our code, hit play, so right now, if I hover over fire ante, uh, fire ante is null. And then I am going to use the step over to in our debugging tools here to let the constructor run without stepping into the constructor. And if I hover over fire ante, I can check the charge distance, the color, the health, the name, and um, this giant string of ASCII art. All of those look like they're working. So this debugger gave us a quick way to make sure that our object was instantiated properly and had all of those fields filled in. So I can leave the debugger and remove my breakpoint. So we have our fields created from our attributes and we can add in these operations. So let's do the display info first. We said that that had to be public. And this also was a, a void return type, meaning it doesn't return anything. So we can then create a display info that prints out some of this information. So we can, let's set the foreground color to be equal to our color. And if I want to use foreground color without having to say system.console.foregroundColor, I'm going to fly up here and say using static system dot console. Whoops. So we're just going to change the foreground color to be this color. When we're finished, we are going to use the console reset color method to set the color back to the default. And then we can just print out like the name here. 
and let's make this a string with interpolation so that I can put the name surrounded by a bunch of dashes and then we can copy and paste this and put the title art here or the, the text art here surrounded by new lines and let's do a final printout here that prints out the health that probably is good let's do one last one we'll just throw some dashes to kind of button this section so that it's easy to see that this is the start and this is the end So if we flip back, um, we'll, we'll use the charge distance in the charge method. So I'm not going to worry about printing that out here. If we flip back to our game, we should be able to use fire auntie to display all of this info in our run method after we display the title. So fingers crossed, we can see our red printout of the fire ant with a health of 100. So it looks like it's working. Flip back to our UML. Last two things for us to knock out are just a charge and a bite um, method, one for each. And we said both of these return void. So public void charge public void byte and for both of these we'll in the final RPG like we're gonna eventually need to be charging at the player and biting the player so we'll have to refactor these later but just to start we can print out something like um, put their name in here name charges swiftly forward and for our charge let's use the charge distance here let's say they swiftly charge forward charge distance inches and for bite we can do something similar viciously whoops Oh, cannot spell. Vish, us, Lee, bites. Or uh, let's make chomps down. So let's make sure that these work and print out the name, and in this case, the charge, and in this case, just prints out viciously chomps down. So we can verify those work by coming back here. Let's have the ant charge and then afterwards, bite. And I think I want, uh, let's add a line, a blank line here to kind of separate out some of this information in our display. So fire, anti, graphic and all that, charges swiftly forward three inches, viciously chomps down. I didn't like how all of that didn't have any of our color involved. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to modify these slightly. I'm going to say that our background color is equal to the character's color. And then what I want to do is just print out their name here first with a space around it. And then I'll reset the color. And I'll print out the rest of this. So it should be something where we, we see the name with background color highlighted, and then this goes back to our normal white text on a background. And I can do the same thing here. Viciously chomps down. All right, that's looking better. You can see we're just we're making use of right here instead of right line to be able to just display this with the background color and then go back to the normal uh, text color here. And because we uh, we've got our ant class as a blueprint and it's all filled out here, 
we can think back to what our designers were telling us originally is like, hey, this is going to have multiple ants um, and each ant is going to be slightly different. So maybe uh, Fire Ante is the first ant that's encountered. And then um, maybe we have another ant called Hades here that is like a boss ant that's stronger that the player is going to encounter. So maybe Hades has 200 uh, for their health. And let's make Hades um, magenta. And maybe Hades can charge forward six inches. So then we can come down here. We can still have Fire Ante displaying. And let's have Hades go ahead and do the same thing. Display, charge, and bite. So we've got Fire Ante and Hades. And we can see Hades is stronger, faster. Um, so we can use that same class that we have developed here for the ant to meet our needs of having multiple different ants that have different specific settings in our world. So we go back to our designers and we say, hey, we did it. We created, uh, we met your first request. We got that ant feature in the game. We're good to go. And our designers then come back to us with a second request. And this is where we're going to start getting into the need for introducing a new concept. So the designers come to us and say, OK, great, the ant feature looks good. Players, our playtesters are loving it. But we, we now need to add a new creature to the world. And we, we want to have uh, bees in the world. So these killer bees that the player has to dodge around um, and encounter. And same deal is that there are going to be multiple bees in the world um, that the player is going to encounter. So we think oh, that probably means we're going to need another class here. And as we're listening to the designers, we're already thinking about the corresponding class diagram in our UML that we'd have to build. So the designers tell us that the bee has a name, like the ant, also has health, also has text art, also has a color, but does not have a charge distance. Instead of the charge distance, the bee has this um, attribute for whether or not they have a poison stinger. Uh, let's say this is has poison sting. So some bees will have poison, some won't, and the player will have to be more wary of the ones that have the poison. Let me just fill in the types as we're going. and make all of these private by uh, as a starting place. So they've told us about the pieces of data the bee needs, and then they tell us that like our ant, our bee also needs to display their basic information, their name, their art. So we got that down. And then they say that the bee can't charge or bite, but the bee can fly and sting. And we will mark these as public. Okay, so we're now in this situation where our designers have asked us to do two classes, it seems, that have a lot of overlap. So if we look at our B and our ant, all of this is shared, and this is also shared. But it's not a 100% overlap. So our B has this unique um, attribute, our ant has this unique attribute, and they both have these unique operations that shouldn't be, like an ant shouldn't be able to fly and sting, and a bee shouldn't able, be able to charge and bite. So we're in a situation where 
we we have a couple of approaches that we could use with just what we know already to try and handle this situation. One is that we could just copy and paste our ant class and rename it to be a B class, delete the charge distance, delete the charge and bite, and replace them with what the B needs here. Hopefully you're thinking, well, copy and paste has not served us well in the past. Um, there's got to be a better way. And you're right. We'll talk about that in a second. But here I'm just going to copy and paste my ant class, rename it to be B, rename the constructor here. D don't do this. I, this is just for demo purposes. We would get rid of the charge distance. We change the art to be the B. We'd get rid of these operations. We'd fill in the has poison sting attribute and the fly and sting operations in here. And we'd have two classes, but these wouldn't be particularly maintainable because if our designers came back and said, you know what, scratch that, health is no longer an integer, uh, we're, we need a double because some things are going to have 0.5 uh, for their health. Uh, they're they're going to have some kind of decimal component to the health. That then means that because we created these as separate classes, we'd have to come in here and update this to be a double. And we'd have to come back to our ant and update this to be a double. And any other classes that we created uh, using this copy and paste method, we'd have to update them. Let me undo this. And the same concept would apply if they told us that, you know, this display info now needs to be updated to not just display their health, but display like a health bar in here. We'd have to come back to the B and the ant and update that. So that's a recipe for bugs if we're doing this copy and paste approach. The other thing that we could do would be to just create a new class that's an ant B that basically has the charge distance, the poison sting, the charge, the fly, the bite, the sting, all together. Um, so this could be the B ant or ant B that is just a combo of all of the features. But this becomes a nightmare to maintain because like, what is a B ant? That doesn't really make sense uh, conceptually. Um, we, we don't have this like mutant. Um, we, we have two separate things in our project. So what I'm going to do is let's get rid of this file where I was doing this experimentation. We don't want to do the copy and paste thing. We don't want to do the mutant ant B class. This is where we need inheritance. So let me move some of this stuff around here. Let's move this up. Let's grab these. And I'm going to copy and paste them down here. Come on, whiteboard, stop freezing. Whoop, okay, you, now you decide to work. There we go. So we've got our ant and our b, and we're going to refactor this using the idea of inheritance. So inheritance in programming is one code sharing technique. I'll just note this isn't the only option. You'll learn more of them later, but it's an important one to know because this is one of the pillars of object-oriented programming. So inheritance lets you start off with a class that has attributes and operations, and then you can say that another class inherits from it, which gets access to all of those attributes and operations. So this is really useful when you have a situation where you want to create a more specialized type of something you already have. So in our situation here, We can create an enemy class and say that our ant and our bee inherit from that enemy class and they will get anything that our enemy class has. So if we said that the enemy has a name and our ant inherits from that class, which we um, denote in UML with an arrow, then our ant no longer needs a name. 
because that feature comes from this inheritance structure. So an ant gets everything that the enemy has and is able to tack on its own uh, extra bits. So what we want to do is let's take our common features from our ant and bee, and they're going to go up here in our, our enemy class. So all enemies will have name, health, text art, color, and let's throw the types in here while we're at it. And we can get rid of them from our ant and our bee. So looking at our structure here, our enemy has name, health, text, art, color, and we're saying ant is a specialized type of enemy. So it has all of those things from enemy, plus it also has charge distance. And the B is the same structure. It has the name, health, text, art, color, because it's an enemy, but it also adds on its own poison sting attribute. So I am going to introduce a new access modifier here. Um, we are marking these fields, these attributes, as protected. We'll get into what that means in terms of our code. They're no longer private. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get into code, but that's what the, the hash means here. And let's also add in our display info so because that is functionality that we're going to need for all of our creatures in our world we can say that that's something that the enemy has and that means that i can zoom in here and try to selectively erase just this probably should have redrawn these but this is what we're going to live with So we, our new structure here, the common features between ant and bee now live in our enemy class, and we use inheritance to say that the ant can tack on its own specialized logic on top of the enemy class. So this is one way that we can share things, um, all of these features that we have in the enemy class, across all of our creatures that we put into this world. So let's add a little bit of uh, terminology over to the side here. So when we're talking about inheritance, you will have a parent class and a child class. And in terms of UML, we use an arrow that points from the child to the parent to indicate this inheritance relationship. And you will hear multiple words thrown around to refer to a parent. It may be the base. Someone may call it the parent class. Someone may call it the super class. And the child may be called the derived class or the child class or the subclass. And you may hear me switch between using these different terms. They're, they're synonyms. They're different ways to refer to this relationship. So in terms of our structure, the enemy is the parent, it's the base class, it's the super class, um, and the ant is the derived child subclass, and the bee is also a derived child subclass. And you may hear folks talk about this as an is a relationship meaning that something is a something else. So ant is a enemy, and b 
is a enemy. So this is a handy way of thinking about inheritance, that we're creating specialized types of something else. And if in English you can describe it as something is a something else, that is a hint um, that maybe inheritance is a good option for solving the problem at hand. So this works for our situation. The ant is an enemy, and the bee is an enemy. If we go ahead and add a spider, the spider is an enemy. So we can kind of build out this tree. And this tree does not have to be just one level deep. So let me do a really schematic version here. Um, so I'm only putting in the class names. I'm not going to go ahead and fill out attributes and operations. But let's say we've got our enemy, ant, b, and maybe we'll, we'll add, um, let's move this over. And let's say later on, we'll need a spider and maybe a beetle. And all of these inherit from enemy. So we're going to use our arrows to indicate that. And then the designers say we need a couple types of bees. So we decide like, oh, we have a queen bee. And we have a worker bee. And same thing for spider. Maybe when we add that feature, we're told we need like a really dangerous black widow. And we also need a um, like jumper spider that has slightly different um, properties and operations versus a, a black widow. So your trees can be much more complex than what we've got here with just the ant, the bee, and the enemy. You can have multiple levels of inheritance. So our queen bee is a child of bee, which is a child of enemy. So the queen bee has all the features of the bee, which has all the features of the enemy. So it can get quite complex. One general piece of advice when you're thinking about building your code is trying to get away with uh, shallow inheritance trees, the, the shallowest that you can get away with. And as you get deeper into programming, you'll understand why these kinds of deeper inheritance trees become harder to maintain. And you'll also learn additional techniques that you can use to share code so that you don't always have to reach for inheritance in all situations. Okay. So that's enough introduction here of inheritance. Let's actually see this in practice. So we're going to move from this situation where we had an ant class with all of these features to a situation where we're going to create an enemy class that has the common features and then a derived ant and a derived B class that has those extra features tacked onto them. So let's flip back to our code and start building this out. So I want to create a new class. I'm going to do it over here. Right click on my project, add a class, call it character. Oh, you know what? I meant to call that enemy. <laughs> Let us rename this. So I'm going to come over here to my sidebar and uh, hit F2 to rename this to enemy. And that automatically renamed it in my file so that I didn't have to rename it manually. And let's grab all of this stuff um, here from the front of my file. Bring it over to enemy. And we do not need charge distance in our enemy. bring in our system.console reference, rename this constructor to be enemy. We could get rid of this field for charge. So right now this has basically all of the information that we said that enemy should have here. Let's 
bring this up side by side. Uh, we have our fields. I still have them as private. We haven't made them protected yet. And we have our display info um, operation here. One thing that we'll have to fix is that right now the text art is hard coded to be the ant. But we want this to be configurable because the sometimes our enemy is an ant, sometimes the bee, sometimes it'll be something else. So let's actually make this a parameter. Let's say that the text art is the fourth parameter that enemy needs. And then we will pass in that text art here. So we've got our enemy class. This is the base class that has those features that are shared across the ant and the bee. And let's refactor our ant so that it uses the enemy class. And then we'll be able to add in our B class that also uses our enemy class. So heading into our ant class, if we want a class to inherit from another class, we add a colon and then we put the name of the parent. So here we're saying ant inherits from enemy. And that's all we need to do to set up the structure of the inheritance. We can then get rid of display info. You can see that it's telling us that ant display info hides an inherited member, enemy display info. And we don't really need ant to have any display info that's unique compared to the enemy. So we can just delete that. So our ant is gonna be able to display information because it's an enemy, because it can run this display info method. Now, when we set up inheritance, our class here uh, needs to actually call a corresponding constructor from the parent. So when we create an ant, we need to express um, in a slightly different form than we, we've done before for calling methods, but we need to express a call to the enemy constructor so that the enemy constructor runs. And the way that you do that here is we're going to add colon base. And then we pass in here the values that we want to use when constructing the enemy um, that the ant is inheriting from. So we can see our IntelliSense telling us that, hey, you said enemy needs name, health, color, text art. So we have to pass all of those in here. So I'm going to pass in the name. I'm just taking this parameter and passing it along to the enemy. Do the same thing for the health, do the same thing for the color. The text art though, that is where I'm going to take the art assets dot ant and grab that. So these parameters come in and then we forward three of them along to the enemy constructor so that those values show up here. And then we also pass in our ant as key art. So we no longer need this information in our constructor. We just need the features that our ant has, which is just the charge distance. So I'm going to get rid of those fields that we were declaring. So we just have charge distance here. Everything else should be coming from the enemy. But as soon as I do that, you can see that we hit all of these errors. Um, it tells me that color is not accessible due to its protection level. Name is not accessible due to its protection level. And that's because, uh, let's bring these side by side. Remember that when we learned about private, that meant that only this containing class was able to access these. If I make these public, that means that anyone can access these fields. So those errors go away here. But that's not really what we intended. We don't want our program, our game class to be able to access these. We're just trying to get it so that our ant can access those. And so that's where this new keyword comes in. So the protected access level means that the enemy can access this and any derived classes like our ant, any child classes can also access the name. 
So you can see that the errors around access went away as soon as I said that these things are protected. So let's bring this back over here. And because these are protected, um, I can't reach them here. So I can't say fire anti.name. That's going to tell me that I don't have access. So we still maintain our kind of protective shield around these fields to enforce that the outside world can't access them. So protected is just so that our current class, our enemy, and any derived classes can access them. Okay, so let's finish up this feature and get our ants working. We have our constructor here, which needs name, health, color, charge distance. The name, health, color are being forwarded on along with the art asset. Let's make sure that in our program class, we're still passing in all of the required bits that we need, or not the program, in the game class here. So we're still passing in name, um, health, color, charge, no errors here. So actually, we don't need to touch anything in our game class. This should still work. So when we call fire anti display info, that is using the code that is not uh, in ant. There's no display info in ant. It's actually using the display info from enemy. So let's run this. So it still works. The info shows up. Health is right. We get our charging and our biting. And Hades has higher health, um, faster dash. So all of the features are still working. We've just refactored our code so that the shared logic is in this base class, in the enemy class. So it can be helpful to, in your game class, throw in a breakpoint to see what's happening. So I'm going to throw a breakpoint in here, and I'm going to throw a breakpoint in here. And we'll see what happens when we construct a new ant, and we'll see what happens when we call a method like display info. So immediately, we get kicked back to our debugger because this game constructor is happening as soon as the uh, program is created. And if I hit F11 or step into, I can watch the ant be constructed. So we can see that the first thing that happens is these values are filled in. I can see my health is 100, color is red, charge distance 3, and then those values are being passed along to the base constructor. So if I hit F11, we're going to leave ant, and we're going to end up at enemy, and I can hover and see fire ante, health of 100, color red, there's my text art, and if I hit F11, I can step through this, the name, health, text art, color, they're all being filled in, so all those fields are filled in, and then if I hit F11, I'm back to my ant, so now that the, the enemy base constructor has run, now my constructor logic specifically for the ant is going to run. So my charge distance um, starts off at a default value of zero, and then after this runs, it's set up to a value of three. Then the constructor's done, and if I hover over uh, fire ante here, we can see all of that stuff has been configured. Some of those fields were configured in the enemy class, and some of them were configured in our ant class. Same thing would happen for Hades, so I'm not gonna run through that, but if I hit continue here, we're going to go to our next breakpoint, jumps down here to fire anti display info. And if I hit F11, we can see that this code inside of the enemy class is being invoked. So our color is being used here, our name, text art, health, all of those are being printed out here to our console. One line at a time. So now I'm done debugging, I can close this, get rid of my breakpoints, and hopefully that helps you visualize what is happening. We have code that is now distributed across two files, but because of this inheritance chain, uh, we can kind of use the debugger to figure out which code is executing. Uh, so when we construct an ant, there's both code inside of our enemy class and inside of our ant class that's running. Okay, so we've got our ant. It inherits from enemy. Let's go ahead and finish up our tree that we were creating here and get a B in our application. So we're, 
a B has all the stuff from enemy plus uh, has poison sting, uh, fly method, sting method. So I am going to create a new class called B. I'm going to say that this inherits from enemy. It has a bool, a private bool, has poison, sting. And I'm going to make sure that I spell poison right. There we go. Has poison sting. The B needs a constructor. So public B. And our B needs the same information as our ant here. Name, health, color. But instead of charge distance, it's going to need the uh, Boolean, whether or not they have poison. So I'm going to grab these cut down some typing. So I've got name, health, color, bool, has poison. And our B, if I hover over it, it's telling me, you know, this has to correspond to a constructor in the enemy class. So here we will call the base constructor and we'll pass in the name, health, color. So we're just forwarding along those three things. And for the last one, the text art, we can reach into our art assets and grab the B ASCII art that I have pulled here. So we don't have to do anything to initialize the name, the health, the color. Those are handled by our base class. But we can say has poison sting is equal to our has poison. Uh, parameter. So our constructor is all set up. The B should have the ability to display information, and then we can add in those two operations that are unique to the B, the fly and the sting. I think since we're building a lot here, let's just try getting this running, make sure we have no errors before we add the next features. So I'm going to head back to game. I want to create a private B, and this will be Busby. The B. Busby is a new B whose name is Busby. Let's say that um, maybe Bs are weaker, so they have this one has 75 health, and this is a. Of course, we are going to use. Um, let's use dark yellow here. And let's say that Busby does have a poison uh, sting. So we should, by the nature of our inheritance structure, be able to come down here and say busby.displayInfo, because displayInfo is provided to us by our enemy class. So hopefully, if I've done everything correctly, I can save this, run it, we should see those two ants, and then at the bottom, Busby's printing out with Busby's health. So now we can tack on to Busby a public fly method and a public um, sting method. Just make sure that that's what I said we were going to do. Yep, fly and sting. And those, again, these would kind of depend on the uh, actual rest of the RPG. Like, what does Fly do? What does Sting do? But for now, let's just have something print out. So I'm going to want to, let's see, bring in the console here using static system.console. And then for flying, we can say that the background color is equal to our color. And remember, we can only we can do that now because in character we said that this is protected. So B can access those protected fields. And same thing as we did inside of our ant. We can print out the name in that background color. We can reset the color. And then we can go ahead and write out that their name is uh, like takes to the air. And we'll do a similar thing here for the stinger. 
we'll print out the name um, and we will say something like lunges forward with their stinger. Um, but actually, maybe we'll make it conditional. So it'll say they lunge forward with their, and if they have a poison stinger, it should say lunges forward with their poison stinger. Otherwise, it should say like something generic, like sharp stinger. And let's make this a right. So these will show up all on the same line. And um, we've mentioned before that if statements, if they have a single line, you can omit the curly brackets. But if you are struggling, I would recommend making sure that you have those curly brackets in there. So maybe I will make this a little bit more verbose and ensure that those curly brackets are in here. So we've got our fly and sting method. If we head back to our game. Let's have Busby take to the, the, the air here. And then Busby can also drop in and sting. And let's add another line at the bottom. So Busby here takes to the air, lunges forward with their poison stinger. If I created another bee that didn't have the poison stinger, or if I came in and said that Busby doesn't have a poison stinger anymore, we should hopefully see lunges forward with their sharp stinger. So at this point, we can go back to our designers and say like, hey, we did it. We uh, Your new request came in that we needed a B that had all of these features and we refactored things so that we, we have it in a better place where we can create an ant that shares these properties and a B that shares these properties. Um, and if you come to us later and ask for a spider or a beetle, we can set up a similar thing really quickly using this inheritance structure. This has a number of benefits. Uh, for instance, if we think about that copy and paste that we talked about maybe doing, like when we didn't have inheritance in our toolkit, we were going to copy the ant class and um, paste it into another file to create our B class. We talked about how that'd be bad because if anything needed to change about our enemy, like if this display info logic needed to change, like maybe instead of... Um, these dashes, we decided we wanted to put some exclamation points next to the name. We'd have to have done that in every file where we did our copy and pasting, but since this is inherited by our B and our ant, by just changing it in one place, we can hit play and Busby gets updated for the display logic, Hades gets updated, and Fire Anti. So anything that inherits from it immediately gets those changes. So this code sharing is really powerful across our um, inheritance structure. So maybe if I wanted to, I, I kind of like what we're doing here with the ant uh, of displaying the name in this flipped color. Um, so if I wanted to come back to my display info, I could do something similar. Um, so let's say that we're gonna display the name in our background color like this. And then here, this is in the foreground color. So we make this change, this new feature to how things are displayed. We hit play and now um, Busby and Hades and Fire Anti have this background color around their name. Okay, so a couple of things that I want to do with our structure. We've got something working now, um, but I want to demo another type of relationship. So 
So we've said that there is this is a relationship for when we have an ant that is an enemy, we have a type that is a more specialized version of something else. There's another relationship that's called a has a relationship. So in this structure, um, if we wanted to let our ants have an item, and that's another class that we're going to use here. Um, let's say like the ants, some ants have like a leaf ninja star, like a, shuru a, a, shuri a shuriken? I'm going to have to check the pronunciation on that, but like a leaf ninja star that they can throw at the player. Um, that would not mean that we would need to create multiple classes. We wouldn't create an ant with item and ant without item subclass. Instead, we can reach for this has a relationship where ant has a item. Ant is not an item. We don't need to do inheritance here. This is just that ant is an owner of some other class here. And we're going to do that by creating an item class really quickly and then creating a new field or property in our ant class. So I'll come in here. I'll create a new class. This will be a really simple class that is... Um, has a name that is a string and a quantity. And you can see that I'm using properties, which we've learned about previously. So I'm creating a public property that anyone can get but can only be set inside of our item class. So we'll create a quick constructor that has these, prop, uh, these parameters used to fill in our fields or our property values. And then I can flip back to my game here and um, let's create an item. Let's we're gonna give this item to Hades. So this will be our leaf ninja star. Leaf ninja star is equal to a new item. And maybe we want 10 of these. So we've got our item created. And if I throw a breakpoint in here and run this, we can check if I look at my ninja star here, the right field has been filled in for name, the right one has been filled in with quantity um, uh, to our properties. So this is looking good. Now I can come back to my ant and modify the ant to be able to have an item that it carries. So I can create a current item field here. And maybe we'll we'll create a public method. Pick up item that takes in an item and stores it into the current item field. So I should be able back in my game to go ahead and after we create Hades, say Hades, time for you to pick up this leaf ninja star. And let's reorganize this a little bit. So I'm gonna create Fire Ante, I'm gonna create Hades, create my ninja star and give it to Hades here. If I throw a breakpoint in, we should be able to hover over Hades and see that new current item here. So that's the ninja star with quantity of 10. And if I hover over fire auntie here, uh, no item. 
so the, the default value of null. So just Hades has that item. So I can leave my debugger. And let's update our logic for our ant so that maybe when they charge forward, we can say what they're holding when they're swiftly charging forward. So we can say if the current item does not equal null, they are carrying a, and then we will print out the current item dot name. Oops, put too many equal signs there. So this is only going to print out if they have been given an item. Remember, we saw that null is the default value for our current item field. So Hades will be swiftly charging forward, and then it will say that they're carrying this item. But Fire Auntie, who has not been given one, let's zoom in here, should not be uh, charging forward with anything. So charges swiftly forward three inches. Hades here charges forward. They are carrying a leaf ninja star. So it's a really um, important concept and one that's tricky to wrap your head around at first. Um, that there are these different relationships that we model in code. So some of them are inheritance structures, like this is a relationship, and some of them are has a relationships, like we're doing here with the current item. So keep those both in, in the back of your mind. It may, not need, uh, it may not be that you need to reach for inheritance for every situation. Sometimes reaching for this has a relationship solves the problem. Because we could have done this with creating two subclasses like ant with item, ant without item, um, but that becomes difficult to maintain and, and tricky, and it's easier for us to just use this has a relationship to model the idea of an ant that um, sometimes has an item, sometimes doesn't have an item. All right, so that was a lot. Let's go ahead and just quickly review, uh, recap what we did here. So we were faced with these changing requirements from our design team. And we started simple with just having an ant class, but as soon as we needed this uh, set of features that were shared across an ant and a bee, we ran into a dead end with our current toolkit, uh, the current concepts that we know. So that's where inheritance came in, which was one strategy for doing code sharing so that we could create a base enemy that has name, health, text, art, color, that is then subclassed by ant and bee. So ant and b both inherit from enemy so they get everything that enemy that the enemy has but they can also tack on their own features so the ant had the item and charge distance and the charge and bite methods the b had has poison sting and the fly and sting um, methods and this isn't the um, limit on how many subclasses you can have we saw over here that you could go crazy you can create all sorts of levels of hierarchy. Um, you won't necessarily want to do that, and we'll get into that later, and you'll learn more about that as you're developing out applications. Um, but you know that it's possible that you can have multiple things that inherit from a parent class, and those things that inherit can also have children. So you can end up with this structure where a queen bee inherits from bee, which inherits from enemy. And we saw all of this both in the whiteboard and in code. And what I would encourage you to do is take this project and take some of the character art here and practice this idea of inheritance. Like, go ahead and create a bat class. Go ahead and create a beetle class that have their own features on top of the enemy class. That will help you practice this concept and make sure that you have inheritance down. All right, that's it for this video. In future videos, we will build on this uh, and make a more advanced version of the application that we've got currently.